This is the Mobile Tech Podcast, brought to you by worldpodcasts.com. Now here's your host, Tank Girl, Miriam Joie. Brought to you by Audible. Stay tuned for a special offer at the end of the show. Hi, and welcome to the Mobile Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Miriam Joie. And today is Friday, July 22nd, 2022. And my guest is the excellent Anshel Sag. Hi, Anshel. How are you? Doing good. How about yourself? I'm great. It's been a, a busy week on phone launches. Uh, we covered the Nothing Phone 1 last week in terms of, you know, the official announcement. But now the reviews are out. And then, of course, the Google Pixel 6a is out as well. I don't have either. They're coming. I guess I'm still second tier. But you know what? I want to talk with you. First of all, do you have the phones? No, I uh, don't have either. But I do have a different phone that's also embargoed, which uh, is in a box just out of frame. It's different tier of device, but uh, it's a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. It's funny because I think I have the exact same phone off frame as well. But that's for another week, folks. Today, we're going to talk about Pixel 6a and about Phone 1, but we're going to kind of get more into like meta review, right? What the reviews out there are saying, what our opinions are. You already know kind of how I feel about nothing from last week, if you listen, folks. But let's start with Pixel 6a because I feel like that's the freshest, the newest. What's your take on that phone? I think if you look at a lot of the reviews, it's kind of what everybody expected it would be. Um, yeah. You know, the price point is correct. I think it could be a little lower, um, but, you know, they could always be a little lower. I think in terms of where it fits into the, the, you know, the phone segment, I think it does well. I think it's primary competitors, the A53 from Samsung. Uh, and it seems like it does a lot better than that phone does. Um, well, it really depends, I think, what your priorities are. I mean, first of all, that's a U.S. view, right? For sure. Right. But I think that if you're looking for a big display that's 120 hertz and that's your priority, I think the Samsung's a better fit. But if you're looking for the camera and a smaller phone and you want all the googly goodness, right, then I think the Pixel 6 is a better fit. And I kind of feel like U.S. consumers are going to be kind of torn. Some of them are going to go for the Samsung just because it's the Samsung, you know? I, I also think that uh, Google's marketing will also be a, a factor, right? Because... They've oh, right. marketed the Pixel line pretty heavily, but it's always been the top of the line. They've never really spent much marketing and and, and ad spend on, on the mid-range. True. Because they've always kind of been on autopilot for the A series, I think, you know? Because the first one they did, like nobody knew what to expect. And they kind of blew us away, right? And then like from then on, people are like, oh, well, I guess it's a Pixel A of some kind, it's going to be good because after that, they kind of blew us away again with the 4A. Remember the 4G one? And then they came out with the 4A 5G, which was just as good in a different way. And then just that we didn't think it could get better, they came out with the 5A, which is just a minor incremental improvement over the 4A 5G, but it's more affordable and water resistant and added a bunch of features. Like it was such a stealth under the radar kind of phone. Like when it was announced, I shrugged and then I got my review unit and I reviewed it for hot hardware. And I was like, oh my God, this is such a delight to use. Like it's a boring looking phone. It spec wise is like very mid rangey, but man, it's good. And I think the 6A's changed things a bit. I think that there's more competition. As you said, Samsung's really up their game on the A series over the years. And I think abroad, there's a ton more competition, nothing. And the Nord 2, Realme, Realme Redmi, Poco with the F4. So I think if you look at the big picture, you know, it's a tough place to be now compared to a year ago. And I think with the previous, the 5A was only sold in US and Japan anyway. So the, it didn't matter in Europe, but now I think this is being sold in Europe. So that means that basically people are going to experience Pixel for maybe the first time in some of these markets. And, you know, it's going to be an option they're going to have to consider. Will they consider it? Like in the US, I think it's very likely people would buy this phone. Like I could see that happening. But I think in Europe, it might be a little tougher and certainly in other markets. What I was also going to say is this kind of extends Google's investment on Tensor. 
in the sense that right. it amortizes their development costs across more devices. And arguably, this device will probably sell in considerably higher volume than the regular Pixels do, because that's kind of been the, the, the A series uh, shtick as of late. Um, and I think that if you look at what they're trying to do, um, they have to be able to justify the investment of building their own chips, even though this is kind of like a semi-custom Samsung chip. Um, I think the performance profile of it uh, is considerably higher than most of the other chips in this price point. Oh uh, yeah, they're definitely winning the performance bang for your buck here, right? Yeah, and I think I think they may be potentially. I don't know what the clock speeds are. I haven't read any reviews that that actually check performance against the the Pixel Six um, in terms of actual numbers. But I have a feeling that the, these might be slightly slower bend chips um, because this is a less expensive device and they can afford to maybe run it a couple hundred megahertz lower and get better yields. You know, you should check out Hot Hardware's review. Since I used to write for them, I actually went and checked that. They did the benchmarks. And since I did the previous benchmarks on the previous pixels for them, um, I noticed it's a little bit slower. So you're right. I think they're binning them or they're running it underclocked a little bit because battery life is killer on this phone from everything I've read, which surprises me because battery life on my 6 Pro is okay but not fantastic and it's kind of decreased a bit in the last few updates and i think that's just you know some software teething problems like google always has like pixels just don't age gracefully right and i don't want to do a factory reset i'm too lazy for that it's my main phone so i think that's my issue with tensor is that i think on this phone it's perfect because it's like giving you all that bang for your buck you kind of like they basically prioritize the processor over the display this time whereas if you look at the previous a's they were more balanced in that sense the display was more in line with the processor but here you're getting a killer processor and then you're getting a 60 hertz display wah, wah, wah. so it's really what what you want to do now with the a series you get a kind of crappy processor frankly and then you get you know i mean comparatively and then you get like a better display you're gonna samsung's gonna make a better display every time it's oled it's 120 hertz you can't go wrong. Now, but if you want cameras, ah, it's always going to be Pixel for me. I'm sorry, right? Samsung's going to be solid, but what would you say? I think on the mid-range, yeah, for sure. I, 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 at the high-end, Pixels are a little bit, it depends uh, on the use case. But I, um, the one thing I was concerned about was thermals because this is a smaller body. Uh, yeah. Using the same SOC, which means there's less space to dissipate heat. But um, it is aluminum frame, so... So maybe it dissipates heat better uh, than a glass body. Um, but that's probably my only concern is just like, how does it handle video recording? Because I had issues recording video on Well, the, the 5A, yeah. I remember that. That was the only major... F- I felt like to me it was a software flaw. Like It, it seemed like this, that chip, the 765G, should have been able to record... 4K 30, no problem all day long. And I don't know, there is something with their thermals or their implementation that was causing some problems there. Do you feel that this phone lacks in terms of its camera specs? Because, I mean, personally, I don't. Like, I feel like it's got the ultra wide from the 6 and 6 Pro, the 12 megapixel, the newer one, but it has the old sensor from all the previous pixels with OIS 12 megapixel, you know, like, what is that, Sony IMX? 363 or something like it's some like started with a pixel three or pixel two right and i think that's a solid sensor in the sense that it's well tuned with their algorithms so why not you know cut some costs there right see i think this is the compromises they made they're really interesting like i don't think it's a glass back i haven't been able to confirm i think it's plastic but at the same time it's a metal frame which you don't see at this price point come you know commonly anymore it used to be more common but they've kind of tuned down the main camera, but gone for tested and true. Then the processor is bonkers good. And then the display is okay. And there's no wireless charging, right? And so that is a bit of a bummer because, well, they didn't have it before, but I feel like, wouldn't it be nice since these three phones kind of look the same, you know, 6A, 6 and 6 Pro, if they all had wireless charging? But at the same time, they removed the headphone jack. So for those people in the A-series, that was one of the big aces of the A-series. You always got the headphone jack. So 
I don't know. I think it's I think it's a solid choice of specs, and it's just a different approach which differentiates enough from the competition that it might make it compelling for some people. But it's definitely not the more well-rounded, well-balanced, kind of all the way around mid-ranger that it was in the previous versions. There's kind of more of a peaks and valley in the spec sheet. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think the 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 peak and the uh, SOC, if you ask me, has more to do with the fact that it's their focus on AI performance and all the Google Pixel experiences are going to be dependent on that processor's performance. So they're really thinking about like all of the language stuff, you know, being able to enable that real time voice voice to text, um, yeah. all the AI image features. I think they are are trying to compromise less on the processor purely because they don't want that experience on the software side to really degrade much. Yeah, you're not going to get that processing that you were getting on the the previous A phones. They would still eventually get you your lovely googly photo out of there, but it would take a little while. Whereas now it's just like instantly, right? Like I assume it is because I don't have the phone. Uh, But look, the reality is this. I don't think you can go wrong at 449 on this. Like I just don't think you can go wrong. If you are in North America and you can live with a 60 hertz display, and you want a mid-range phone, and you can live without wireless charging. Those would be the two things for me that are like, mm, because of what I'm used to in my day-to-day with my flagships. If the, I would totally go there. I, I think if I had like, you know, buy my own phones and be on a more of a budget, it would be a toss between this and the Nothing Phone 1 for me. But the Nothing Phone 1 wouldn't work in the US properly, so then it would be this. Like, I don't see myself getting A53. That's not happening. Like, I like Samsung, but I'd rather wait for a sale on a S21 FE or something, you know? I was just Googling to see the price of that. Oh, yeah, go for it. So what is it? What is so, it? So actually, you can get an S21 for $449 right now. Oh, my God. Well, that. Oof. And it's a 128 gig as well. Yeah, so that's the other thing. There's only one storage option, 128 yeah. gigs. You get six gigs of RAM, which I think is fine. Um, yeah, it's it, you can get it for four forty nine right now from Samsung. Wow, Samsung makes it hard. Like I definitely wouldn't buy an A fifty three if I like if I was set on buying a Samsung phone in this price point, I'd one hundred percent get an S twenty one. So you want to hear a funny story? Uh, a friend of mine recently was looking for a new phone right yeah. when the A fifty three came out, and uh-huh. I was recommending it to him because I was like, this is probably in your budget, like the best deal. Uh, Cause when it came out, it was a great, it was a great choice, but they mm-hmm. were completely out of stock. If you remember when they first launched. Oh yeah. Um, as usual with supply issues right now, that's everybody. So he ended up actually getting like an S 21. Cause it was just on sale at that time. And I was like, dude, S 21 versus a 53 is kind of a no brainer. Right. It's like, yeah, you can't go wrong here. This is, this is, I would pick the S 21 in a heartbeat. Sorry. You know, like, come on, it's 888, right? Like, pff, it's that's still so solid. A last year flagship is still better than like a, you know, a slightly up, upper, upper mid tier. I kind of feel that if you have a phone right now with an 865 still, you're, you're good. Like, I tell you why, because the 865 plus plus, aka the 870 exists and is still being obviously actively sold. And there's some great phones out there with it including the Poco F4, which are just like, you ask yourself, why do I need more than an 870 when you use that phone? Like you play games on it and you're like, I've got like the Red Magic 7S Pro in my pocket right now. Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. And honestly, I'm like, do I need that? Because I play games. I mean, of course you got, you know, the fan and you've got the trigger buttons. But if I'm playing the same games on the F4, which I have as well, it's like, yeah, honestly, the battery life's better on the F4. The thermals are better, and I don't see any difference in performance. Now, I'm talking about like some of the more hardcore games. So the question is, do we really need anything more than an 870 right now? Which is essentially a what three year old architecture now? Yeah. Wow. Like, think about this, guys. If you have a OnePlus 8 Pro right now, as long as the software is updated, which is probably getting a bit long in the tooth now because 
you know, Oppo BBK Group One Plus doesn't quite have the best track record anymore. But that phone, performance-wise, is going to be perfectly good enough today. So the question is, if you're presented with an S21, with an 888 in there, you can get a deal on it right now. I say 100% all the way. Yeah. I think the only um, significant difference is actually AI performance. So if you're yeah. doing any kind of AI, if you have any software that utilizes AI acceleration, um, and uses an API, um, every generation, they almost double AI performance, which... But that's why you buy a Pixel 6a, because now you get all the tensor goodness, right? Or yeah. that's why you buy that F4, because, well, you're right, it does have the 870 that does have the latest AI. But I'm thinking, what other... Well, a phone with a Dimensity 8100 would have better AI than an 870, yeah? I don't know the, the comparison against each other. I mean... Just intuitively, simply because it's a newer chipset, and so it has probably more of the latest AI pipelines. That would be a good. I mean, I'm not like Ars Technica, or you know, a non-tech here. That's not my thing. But somebody needs to write that article. <laughs> you know, the second highest tier chip from MediaTek. Does it beat the 870 in terms of AI performance? Oh, I should pitch that to uh, to Dave at Hot Hardware. He'd go all over that. Uh, anyway, so look, Pixel 6a, folks, um, I say 100%, go for it. Just uh, if you're coming from a 120 hertz display or you want wireless charging, that's the only pause, you know, that I'd have there. But the camera is going to be awesome and the performance is going to be awesome. And the battery life seems incredible. And it's Google. Like you get all the googly stuff, like the, you know, hold for you feature when you're on a call or the uh, screening of calls, like stuff that I use almost every day on my Pixel. I don't know about you, but. I, I don't use my Pixel as often as I used to, um, but it used to be my secondary phone. Yeah. So, you know, my only gripe right now with the Tensor chip in general is, and this is coming from me being a 6 Pro user, is the uh, kind of crappy radio performance, you know? Um, especially when I'm traveling a lot, I need, you know, I notice the difference uh, in 5G performance versus a Snapdragon, like, flagship chipset, like an 8 Gen 1 or something, or an 888. And that vexes me a bit. And also, I feel like, I don't know. I'm not sure. Like clearly power management works really well on the 6A. So my, I feel power management on the 6 Pro, maybe the 6 is a bit better because it doesn't have that massive quad HD display to drive. But my, my battery life is good, but not as good as it was six months ago. And usually I see more degradation a year, a year and a half into using my phones. So it seems to be happening a little earlier, but I think it might be software related. Like I, I think it's some update they did to make the radios a little more sticky in terms of hanging on to signal. And I'm noticing that because of that, the battery life has taken a hit. I don't know, something like that. So can we please get Google once they exhaust the supply of Tensor chips to give us a Tensor 2 that has not just the next level of radio from Samsung, but the latest, newest level of radio from Samsung? Because they're not, like, an ideal scenario would be Okay, let's rewind, actually, because I think I've been saying I would rather have a Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 on my Pixel, but I know that the Tensor stuff is making a lot of those features possible. So here's my question to you. Why didn't Google go to Qualcomm and get them to make a bespoke chip? Is it Qualcomm doesn't want that because they want their brand out there? Because, you know, they did it with Microsoft, on, and, and that kind of seemed to be a disaster, honestly. Well, why didn't they go to MediaTek and say, make us a Dimensity 9000 bespoke version? I guess they needed millimeter wave. And at the time, uh, they didn't have it. Now they have it with the 1500, the Dimensity 1500. I don't know why they didn't go to Qualcomm and say, Qualcomm, make us a chip. Here's, take our money. I think it has to do with the fact that part of the reason why they went with Samsung was because it was a relationship that they had with Qualcomm. And I feel like the whole purpose of doing these Tensor chips uh, was to have more control over their destiny. And by simply reconfiguring re their relationship with Qualcomm, I'm not sure that they probably felt like that changed much for them. Um, right. 
But that said, they're still dependent on Samsung. Um, and, you know, they're still able to, you know, dictate certain parts of the SOC, but they're still dependent on Samsung foundries and their roadmap. Uh, and they're still dependent on, on Samsung to, to build cores. Um, they're still dependent on ARM. Um, so they're, they're really only making a few things that are different than uh, what otherwise would be an off-the-shelf part. So I think you're right. They could have easily done the same thing and gone to MediaTek. Um, but I, I just think that they, they wanted to have the whole relationship, which includes Samsung Foundry. Um, and I think that they had the modem at the time. And maybe, maybe they look, give MediaTek a second look. But that said, I believe the Samsung modem is still discrete. And so is MediaTek's modem. Right. Um, so why not do a hybrid where you go Samsung SOC with a Qualcomm 5G chip? Huh. I, I have no, no clue, but it's, it's possible. Or it could be possible. Every I time we see Samsung, it's a discrete solution. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean the thing is, is that every time Samsung ships an Exynos chip SoC, they usually use an Exynos modem. So there might be a little bit of a uh, you know a tie together, but yeah, some economies of power management or bus speeds or something there. Um, yeah, I just I I don't know. I just I'm not sure Samsung was the right partner. At the same time, I can see they can they can leverage that relationships more because Samsung is eager, right? And because Samsung's having a lot of problems with Exynos and also having problems with their foundries. I and mean, been I honestly, years. I mean, honestly, from everything I've seen of the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 phones so far that I've used, I haven't run benchmarks, but from everything I've seen, thermals and battery management are better simply because they switched to essentially a TSMC process. Like, guys, that is not so. Like, I did not think that the process could make such a difference, but it is. And I think we're going to look back at 2022, folks, those of us who are nerdy enough to care about this stuff and say the 8 Plus Gen 1 was the flagship chip, whereas in the past, the Plus chips have always been like, eh, you know, it's kind of like a binned chip. It's kind of like the chip you put in a gaming phone or some hardcore, you know. But this year, I think that we're going to turn around and go like, you know, all the rumors are pointing to the 10 T from one plus having an eight plus gen one. And I think we're going to look back at that phone go. That was the real flagship, like in terms of performance, battery life and thermals. Right. Whereas for sure, like in terms of specs, the 10 pro is the better phone. Right. But just on that, and it's in that sense, there's a very much a parallel with the six a, I think it's like, it's a phone that cuts a few corners, but gets the processing just perfect value. I think you're totally right about the whole the 8 plus Gen 1 device being the real flagships because, you know, it sounded like even Qualcomm was taken by surprise by how much performance they gained as well as power consumption improvements. So I, I think the, the efficiency gain was so huge that they were able to increase performance and save power, which, to your point, looks much better than just a regular uh, process node speed bin. Yeah. And I think, remember, even when they announced it, showed it to us under embargo back in the day in San Diego, their messaging was a bit weird to me. I'm like, why are you not telling this is just a bin extra slightly faster? Because that's what we were expecting. We're like, it's a plus chip. We know what, totally know what to expect. And then they pull this thing out and they go like, yeah, this is actually a different thing. And we're like, huh? And then we ran the benchmarks and we're like, oh boy, oh boy, this is, this is surprising. And I think that's the exciting thing here. I think personally, TSMC has always been, I think, ahead. And the when Qualcomm announced the partnership with Samsung, I was just like, oh, I don't know. Like for me, it was like I didn't think it was going to be the best, the best solution. And and here we are, you know. Um, speaking of which, this is actually a really good segue to talk about the processor in the phone one, because nothing seems to have gotten kind of a slightly adjusted you know, Snapdragon 778 Plus. Now, the 778G Plus is a chip that was announced. It exists. It's in. It's available to manufacturers. But we haven't really seen any phones with it, have we? Until this one. And this one also, I think, has wireless charging enabled, which I think wasn't part of the 778G Plus spec sheet. So what do you take of this? That's, do you think that call pay being seen with the Qualcomm folks Don and stuff 
at the at, at MWC there, that, that little photo where you see uh, Don McGuire's shoes, actually. It's Don McGuire's shoes. He told me, he was on the show once, and he, he told me. Um, like, do you think that that's what they were kind of like making special tweaks for, for, uh, for nothing? I mean, I've seen Qualcomm do this before, where they will, you know, spin a, a small variation of a chip to satisfy an OEM. Uh, you know, they've, they've done, done with Xiaomi a, a lot. Yeah, exactly. So remember the 780G? I, exactly what I was going to bring up. Um, so I, I think that this is probably one of those scenarios where um, it's very similar to the 780G. Um, and it probably is probably difficult to discern from one to the other, but it might be cheaper. Um, and it might be a chip that maybe Qualcomm isn't selling as much of that they're willing to make compromises on to. It's also a Samsung a uh, manufacturing process, I believe. It's not TSMC, this one. Yeah, it seems like uh, if you look at the way Qualcomm splits out their process nodes, they'll pick a certain series and just stick to one process node on that series. Right. And then, and then maybe they'll have TSMC at the top and then they'll have Samsung at the bottom. And that's how they were able to balance their, their foundry orders so that they didn't have any shortages or they were less affected by them compared to everybody else. Yeah, so to me, the takeaway from the reviews on the Nothing Phone 1, and I don't want to spend as much time on the Nothing Phone 1 because we've really covered it extensively last week, but basically, the reviews are confirming what we thought, right? This is a solid, solid mid-ranger. And if you look, to me, if you look away from all the gimmicks, all the marketing, all the stuff in the back, the transparency, the glyphs, the colors, the LEDs, the flashy lights, you know, you look at it and you're like, okay, this is a mid-ranger that I would want spec-wise. It's like up there with the Nord 2T, right? Or the Nord 2 or, or you know, even better in some ways than the Poco F4 in the sense that this is an aluminum and glass sandwich, which you don't usually get. One of those two is compromised. Either the frame is plastic or the back is plastic at that price point. And you're getting OIS on the camera. So again, no compromise there. You're getting wireless charging, right? The only imaging kind of compromising they made is using that Samsung JN1 sensor for the ultra wide, which has the smallest pixels to the to date, right? Like 0.64 micron or whatever it is. Um, and that's the same sensor as in the OnePlus 10 Pro, by the way. So, you know, um, but this, the IMX 766 with OIS is, is kind of appears on a ton of BBK group phones right now. With OIS, like even on lower price tiers, which is really amazing. And so we, you know, and this is not a BBK phone, but, you know, the BBK heritage. And I'm sure that the parts supplier for nothing are very closely related to the parts supplier for BBK guys. Okay. Like in terms of manufacturing, do we even know who's making the nothing phone one? Oh, I don't. I was just going to say, what if it's the same CM? <laughs> what if it, I was going to say, it's probably the same factory anyway the point is it's a solid mid-ranger good display 120 hertz amoled you know you're getting like wireless charging ois you're getting a decent processor the only thing on the spec sheet that's lesser than a flagship on this phone is the processor and apparently and this is why i brought it up as a transition piece the processor is also having some trouble with with battery life it's not delivering as good a battery life as you'd expect from the battery capacity that it has. And, you know, again, maybe that's the 778G plus, T, you know, if it was made by TSMC, it might be slightly better. Who knows? But then on top of that, you get all this kind of extra marketing slash gimmicky goodness, which I think is fun. If you want a phone that stands out, something that's different, you get that for free, basically. You know, I'm not sure anybody's going to care too much about the glyphs and the blinking lights on that phone. What, what's your take? Do you, are you in? Do you think it's going to make a significant difference with your experience? I think it's one of those things where it enables people to stand out and yeah. feel different from everybody else. But yeah. ultimately, it doesn't really change the user's experience. But that said, there's a lot of things that don't change the user experience that people still pay for. So... Yeah, I mean, I think that for some people who are a little shy and want something a bit more boring, this is not your phone. But if you're looking for, you don't care about the aesthetics of your phone at all, like you don't even care about the blinking lights and you can live with them or even turn them off and you want a really solid mid-ranger and you're in Europe, dude, this phone, this phone, 
right? That's what I'm saying. It's this phone or the Pixel 6a. And I think you're making some, in some ways you're making more compromises of 6a, you know, overall. Mm -hmm. Like you might remember how I said like the, the smoothness of the spec sheet in terms of spec balancing is less smooth on the 6a than it is on the nothing phone one. In my opinion, you're getting yeah. more of the key hitters on the nothing phone one. The only thing is a little lesser is a processor and the battery life. But then on top of that, if you are a flashy person like you and I, <laughs> and you want something fancy and fun, like you get this cool little crazy transparent back and the glyphs and the blah, blah, blah. And I got to give Carl some serious props. Like I knew he was going to give us a good phone. I knew this was going to be in line with the Nord because the Nord I feel was his baby. And I think it was so much his baby that. And let it go. Well, yeah, no, but what I'm saying, yeah, you're right. But what I'm thing more I was getting to is is that Pete Lau was like no this is too this is not we want to be like they're looking at longer term business we don't we want to commodify right this is the all one plus oppo merging and like they're all just becoming one big kind of boring blob in a way right unless you buy like an oppo find x5 pro and then you or you know you get like the top of the line phones and I think it wasn't profitable enough and it was, you know, just a little too call pay. And so that's probably why it didn't work out. And they moved on from each other. And now he's able to do what he really wants to do, you know. And, it, and he's still delivering that OnePlus Nord, you know, experience of the spec sheet being so well balanced and the value being so off the charts. And, you know, I think a lot of reviewers are like, yeah, it's a really good mid-range phone. You can't go wrong. But I think people are underestimating the fact that this is more than that. This is an incredible spec sheet for the money. Like it's aluminum and glass. Mm -hmm. Like you don't always get, like I can see like, if they didn't have wireless charging and didn't have OIS and had aluminum glass, I'd be like, okay, that's what I expect. Or if it did have OIS and it didn't have, it had a plastic frame. But at that price point, you don't get all of those hitting points. You don't get them all. The fact that you do here like, kind of blows me away and makes me wonder if there is a profit margin for them. What do you think? Do you think they can make money on this? I think it's probably a challenge in the beginning, as it always is. Yeah. Um, usually your first phone is not your most profitable. In fact, it's usually your least. Um, yeah. But I would say that I think the importance here was really for, for them to establish the brand um, and to land with their first product. And, uh, you know, after that, it's, it's, it becomes much easier. Obviously, it's not an easy thing to do, but I just think that they've established the brand now and they've, they've you know, they've got positive reviews and there's going to be people who, who own them and will talk about them. And, you know, word of mouth is one of the best ways to sell phones. 100%. My colleague, Arian, at pocket now bought the phone he was very gung-ho and i said do you want to review it for us because i know i wasn't getting one jaime got one and he did our video review of course and i couldn't get another phone so i said to arian yes absolutely you bought it you're obviously into this write the review and you know i'll post it in the show notes and it's you know just kind of confirms what everybody else is writing you know some people are saying the cameras are okay but not great I actually think that from what I'm seeing from the samples, I actually think that maybe all these reviewers are using flagships all day long and not really understand how good those photos are for a mid-range phone. Like, I think for a first try, it's really hard to get the camera tuning as good as they did. And there's room for improvement. And it's just all software because the hardware components, other than, like I said, the JN1 being a little iffy in pixel size, I think everything's really solid in the imaging. I do wish that more Chinese phone makers, and I count nothing as a Chinese phone maker, I'm sorry, because you know it's designed and engineered and made there, that they wish that 1080p on the front camera, guys, has got to end. <laughs> you know, like Samsung's not doing it. Apple's not doing it. Some select phones are not doing it. And we need, we need 4K on the front camera all the time, every phone, right? I agree. I, I mean, I my my primary is a S twenty two Ultra, so uh, I've yeah. got a big big old honking sensor on the front there. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, to me, I think nothing 
phone one, the reviews confirm everything we talked about last week. It's solid. And I would say that if you're in a market where you have support for 5G on that phone, to strongly consider it if you're looking at a phone around $500. In the same way as the 6A is a solid contender there too. So we got two phones this week that I really, I think, put the mid-range back in focus. You know, I this is good news. In this economy right now, this is really good news. So... Uh, that's why I want to spend a huge amount of the podcast talking about these two. And also the, the choices and the decisions that are being made. Like, you know, going back to the imaging on the nothing, you've seen the photo samples. Do you agree with me that it's actually probably better than people give it credit for in the sense that it's their first time doing a phone and that it, um, you know, delivers something close to, a, you know, like uh, last year's, I would say it's close to last year's flagships. Yeah, it's a mid-range phone. Yeah, I mean, especially when it's a first phone. That's always, you know, the challenge is just being able to get the software stuff in place to make it look competitive. And for me, I'm pretty lenient because I know how difficult it is to build a phone from the ground up. Um, so I, I think being able to deliver something um, that, that most people agree is fairly good is already a win for them. Like... I feel like they achieved from launch something that it took, what, 10 years for OnePlus to achieve? You know, like it, it wasn't until really, I think the OnePlus 9 that we got relatively on par camera performance from OnePlus. Maybe the 8, right? I feel like the 8 came really close. Close came, enough to came be... close. But that's, that's how long it took them to get somewhere. And that's for flagships. This is a mid-ranger and it's already there. Like, wow. Like, I don't know if they just license somebody's imaging pipeline or just use Qualcomm's, but Qualcomm's, in my opinion, is not that great. Like the Qualcomm Snapdragon 4 fans phone, whatever it's called, you know, the one I'm talking about, that phone doesn't have good camera performance, yet it's using all of Qualcomm's pipeline. Like I've never felt that Qualcomm's default, if you want to use an imaging pipeline, we've got one off the shelf, has ever been that great. I'm not sure that was it was fully implemented in the device we're talking about. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a lot of things we could talk about on this device. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's an interesting experiment. Um, but I feel like, you know, a lot of manufacturers that use Qualcomm chips in, sometimes can do better in imaging simply because they don't have anything in-house and they're using the off-the-shelf from Qualcomm. So that tells me that either they're not implementing properly or Qualcomm's not delivering a good enough imaging pipeline as an off-the-shelf thing, right? I have a feeling that's the latter because every you know company that has spent time developing their own imaging pipeline, Xiaomi, BBK Group, uh, and and Apple and Samsung, obviously, and Google are delivering finally some solid thing. And here's nothing comes along and bang, almost nails it first try. Like wow, okay, how did that happen, right? Like. Just think maybe, of that. Maybe us. they are using that imaging pipeline. <laughs> well, maybe they, they licensed it from BBK for all we know. Or they, I mean, there's also like companies like Cyberlink too. So Right, true. There's, there's a lot of third parties who are also pretty prominent across the smartphone industry. What if, what if nothing is really just another BBK experiment? Conspiracy theory. I know. Oh man, <laughs> I just had to throw that out there. Because you remember when OnePlus started, right? Like, no, you know, we're just our own thing. We're like our little startup. Yeah. Once we started digging, it was like, yeah, right. You're not, okay? You're so, your strings are so attached. And now, obviously, it's very, very obvious. Um, but it's just interesting. I, I'm super happy about this. I feel that of all the companies that have come along and made a first-time phone, remember Nextbit Robin? Remember Essential? Uh, what other players do we have here? Am I missing any major ones? Not recently. Right? Nobody's delivered this good from day one. Nobody. Essential, Essential, I think, had a lot more resources and a lot more experience under their belt and was catastrophically worse. Yes. And then nothing, I think, did okay, but did pretty much what we expected. It was okay, but not great. Whereas this is, I think, good to great out of the box. So... Now, the question is, can they keep the momentum? Can they 
deliver on these updates and support that they promise. That's a long tail, right? Like four years of software updates, that's hard. Remember how OnePlus did that for a while? Yeah, it's expensive. And more importantly, this when you start proliferating your portfolio, when they make the phone two next year or two years from now, whenever, they're going to have to support more stuff. And that's the big question to me is when we get the phone two, how many compromises are they going to be? Because they're going to start looking at their cost sheet, right? Like, are they going to cut out the aluminum frame or the UIS or the wireless charging or whatever? Now, I know Carl and I have doubts that they'll break that formula. But how long can they survive as a business if they don't break that formula? You know what I'm saying? Like, think of OnePlus in the early days versus OnePlus now, you know? So it's not the same. It's not the same formula. So anymore. don't get too warm and fuzzy and attached yet. Okay. Just, just enjoy the phone for what it is. Keep your distance. Keep your distance. Stay in your lane. All right. Okay. Let's talk about news. Now we've kind of covered all the important stuff for the reviews, but look, I think it's been an interesting week because there's a bunch of stuff that's kind of like we knew was coming. So, of course, the big news this week, if you're in the US at least, because Samsung, Apple, Duopoly, is the Galaxy Unpacked event scheduled for August 10th. So prepare to be bombarded with $5 billion of marketing or something. So as an aside, also, there's an article on TechCrunch here that says that people prefer flip-style folding phones. According to Samsung, 70% of people that they surveyed prefer the flip phones, like the, the flipped over the fold. I completely get that. I, as much as I love the fold and I'm, I can never feel that I have a use case for it. The Oppo Find N to me was the only like book style folding phone that worked because it wasn't too big when it was open. Yeah, yeah, I know you, you know, there's, there is Microsoft. Uh, Unshell was just showing the, sur the Surface Duo, but I feel like the flip style is the one people want. Like Theo went nuts over the D Flip 3 last year to the point where I bought them one and they're using it as their second phone in Canada right now. And this is an hardcore Apple user switching to Android while they still have the iPhone, of course. But like that, that's how you never see that, okay? And then honestly, the next question related to the unpack is, they can only be really evolutionary this year with the flip. Like last year was the big step, right? Lower price, water resistance, better form factor, better build, better reliability. Everything was better, right? I don't see them doing this again for another year. Like at this point, this is going to basically be, we stick an 8 plus Gen 1 or an 8 Gen 1 in there and we make the colors better and we improve the cameras a little bit and maybe the battery life a little bit. And that's it. That's your phone, right? Like, is that a bad thing? No, but don't get your hopes high on anything else. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, I, I pretty much agree across the board. I think they're mostly going to be delivering like maybe the outside screen will get a little bit bigger and better because they've done that generationally. Um, and the cameras will probably get better like they did generationally. Uh, and they'll probably make the screen more durable as they've done with every generation. And, and they'll probably iterate on the hinge again. So it's very iterative. Um, but I think this year will probably be less, more iterative, less, you know, revolutionary. Um, and yeah, I, I think you're right. Maybe, maybe they might change the design language a little bit. Um, maybe make it a little bit smoother, uh, which they kind of did last gen as well. Because remember, it used to be really square and it kind of like smoothed off a little bit. Um, maybe they'll make the screen slightly larger. That would be, that would be interesting. Um, yeah. But, but I think you're right. And this 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 whole article, uh, I just think that when I've presented people flip and fold, a lot of people prefer the flip over the fold. I personally am a foldy boy, um, but that's because I like having that big screen and being able to dual screen stuff. Um, but I also would like the fold to be a little bit wider than it is currently. Um, and I I'm actually uh, not in the camp of the Find N. In the sense that um, one, I don't have one, but also I play with it. I've played it with it enough that like I don't like that form factor as much because I don't feel okay. like I'm gaining enough screen space compared to if I had like um, some other foldables. Yeah, no, I I don't disagree. Like I think that it really is a personal preference, and I feel like for me, the Find N was the first 
non-flippy but foldy phone that I was like, I don't have to adjust my use cases. That's so that's the biggest thing for me. And I think that's why I think the flip is more successful is because people can picture themselves using this because it's like, okay, what's in my pocket, it's folded, it's protected, it's smaller, it's more convenient. I pull it out and I can see my notifications. And then when I want to get productive, I open it up and I get exactly the same experience I'd get on S22, right? And that I think is why it flies. Now, the end for me was similarly like that in the sense that, it gave me that seven inch plus real estate, but it was still a phone experience. I didn't have to worry about adjusting windows and multitasking and getting all hardcore like you would or like Michael Fisher, Mr. Mobile would, because you guys are even more power users than I am. I'm just lazy. I just like, for me, multitasking is just basically a, a stack of cards and I bring one app to the forefront. I'm windowing, I'm not in for windowing yet. I'm, I'm currently speaking to you with a 49 inch, a 40 inch, and a 34 inch, all ultra wide. I know so. your desk setup is insane. I've seen <laughs> photos. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a preference thing, but I am totally not surprised by these numbers. And I just want to kind of say that, yes, if you, you're going to see a lot of hype around these uh, folding and flippy phones from Samsung, but I think it's going to be very evolutionary and that's totally okay. So if you have a Z Flip 3 right now, Wait till next year because I don't think this is going to matter at all for you. If you have a Z Fold, maybe because you're time more of an early adopter, you might want to update. If there's a significant improvement, maybe the under display camera is significantly improved. Or I hope so. Know, yeah. Or or the and maybe the eight plus Gen one brings huge battery life improvements to the table. We don't know, right? And I assume that's what we're going to see on these phones. But um, speaking of other launches, which I think are going to be less hyped, but I think are just as important. We talked about the OnePlus 10T, which is launching August 3. We don't know much about it other than it's not, you know, it's a flagship, but it's not like a pro model, right? So the spec sheet should be lesser than the 10 Pro, except we all think, right? I mean, come on, they can't launch this thing with, with an 8 Gen 1. It's got to be 8 Plus Gen 1, right? I mean, I feel like it. The T has always been the one where they've where they've gone with the faster chip if they could. Exactly. So I'm actually excited that we get to see this phone. Like we didn't get a T last year in the US and we got the 9, which I think was a miss because no OIS plastic frame. It was basically the carrier phone. They made a phone for the carriers in the US, which as you know, the carriers in the US are misguided. And uh, <laughs> sorry, that's a polite way of putting it. And so we got the shaft. And anybody who bought that phone, I feel really bad for you because the Nord is a better phone. Um, <laughs> and of course, the Nord doesn't work in the US. So, yeah. But speaking of BBK group, goodness, dude, I have this phone right now. The Realme GT2 Explorer Master Edition, it, it just looks as awesome as in these pictures. Like it is like the design. What I love about Realme is they take a slab phone, which is boring AF, and they make it look without like expensive flip or, you know, extra displays or hardware. They make it look super cool. You know, I'm surprised that they're able to get that chip in there with that price point. Well, yeah, it's an 8 plus Gen 1, yeah? Yeah. And on top of that, bucks. it's got the, it's the first phone in the world with LPDDR5X RAM. Which is, again, all about the performance story, right? It's really about yeah. just getting you the fastest processor and the fastest memory. And here are the prices, folks. This is the craziness, all right? You can get um, 518, $518 in Indian... Mm, currency equivalent for the uh, entry level 8 gig, 128 gig. This thing has OIS on a IMX 766, which is very on brand for uh, a BBK group phone right now. Uh, and it's a solid camera system. It's like the, I think the IMX 766 is the new IMX 586. You know, it's like on everything and it's a good, it's a good sensor. It's solid, you know? But this phone, the specs, wow. And the hardware, it looks so great. I have the one that, you know, has that kind of like cream color with the, the, the brown. It's actually an anodized brown aluminum. I didn't realize that. Like, it's not cheap. Like, they are not cheaping out on this thing. It's insane. I think they're probably able to get enough volume. I, I, I can't imagine anything else being the way they would have been that viable. You know, so let's see, what, what do we have here? So I said uh, IMX 766, 
We've got uh, a 50 megapixel ultra wide, probably the JN1. Yeah, there's a microscope. There's a 60 megapixel front camera. Uh, it's got, uh, what's the chart? 5,000 milliamp hour battery. Well, actually, I'm reading the, this is the, uh, I'm reading the wrong one. So it's got a, a full HD 120 hertz display, AMOLED, of course. Um, and I'm trying to see what the actual specs are in terms of charging speeds. Do you see that anywhere in there? Didn't I just close that tab? <laughs> it's okay. I think it's like, uh, it's, it's not like 150 watt, like their uh, GT3 Neo, uh, but it's, it's, um, it's, I think like hundred watt or 80 watt or something. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing. No wireless charging on this because it's real me. I feel like real me is the new one plus. Do you feel the same way? At this point, in terms of what one plus was originally intended to do. Yeah. It's kind of what it is. Yeah, so that's a good one. It's finally out. We we knew it was coming because it leaked the design and we were all kind of like, whoa, this is cool. And then they sent me one and now it's official. So expect a video on my YouTube. Expect me to cover it in more depth in the future. Uh, similarly, another BBK group phone that's out there now is uh, it's now available globally. We talked about it a few weeks ago when it was announced in China as the Reno 8 series. And the top dog of the Reno 8 series is a Dimensi 8100 phone. So it looks more like Oppo Find-ish, right? It's just kind of well, cool. I think, uh, I guess it depends which Find, right? Well, I'm talking about the Find X5 and Find X3 Pro. It's got that camera bump that melds into the body is what I'm saying. And this okay, is genuinely yeah. melding. It's actually, I think it's glass on this. So they're actually doing the, the sculpted thing. I, I really like the look on the X, Find X5 Pro. Yeah, so this too, is kind of this is kind of like a, an extension of that, and I a little it's... bit I would say a little bit more of like a um, harsh way, maybe a little bit less smooth. So yeah. I think that bump was very like silky smooth in how it was implemented. Yeah, this is definitely more abrupt for sure. So you know what's interesting to me is the Reno series kind of started off as a, a premium mid range metal and glass top specs. Remember they did a periscope zoom. And everything, and then it kind of slowly descended into the opification plastic every you know everywhere, and more importantly, it looked cool, but it just kind of felt cheap for a little while. And then with the six, they started going back to more premium build and design, and then the seven really nailed it. You know, slab sided, very iPhone like better features, better materials. And then the eight is continuing that. I think that's kind of why I'm excited about these phones because they are a true mid-ranger or premium mid-ranger from Oppo. And what stands out to me is not only that they use Dimensity 8100, they're using their, their own ISP here. You know, the Mary Silicon X chip from the Oppo Find X5 Pro is in that phone. I did not realize that. Yeah, it's the first... Dimensity phone with that chip because I thought it was after the isn't the X5 Pro also have it? Yeah, but the Dimensity version doesn't have it. Really? Yeah, so this is the thing you have to understand. This doesn't apply to anyone who's listening because it's a China only thing. I have both here. I actually did some consulting about this. Basically, I figured out that there's a bunch of things that are much worse on the Dimensity 9000 version of the Oppo Find X5 Pro. It's, the processor isn't worse. I mean, it's a really solid processor, but they removed the Mary Silicon X and they removed the in-body stabilization as well. So it doesn't have the same camera system. It has the same sensors, but the optics are slightly different and the UIS system on the main camera is very different because as you know, the Find X5 Pro combines in-body stabilization and lens stabilization. So it's a hybrid between you know, the lens moving and the, the sensor moving. Whereas the Dimensity version of the Find X5 Pro is purely the, uh, the lens moving, this traditional OIS. That's super confusing. Because and I there's totally. No Hasselblad branding and no Hasselblad features. Right. I mean, I could see that being like a cost cutting move. I mean, everything you described sounds like a cost cutting move. Sounds like they were trying to hit a different price Yeah, and point it is China. definitely cheaper in China. But I also was surprised that the Mary Silicon X wasn't in there. Like I thought for sure, and I thought the hardware was parity other than the processor, but there's other things that they changed is what I'm saying. That's really interesting because I had the same assumption you did. I do not have that phone. And it sounds like 
uh, I probably don't want it. But um, I really thought that the whole purpose of doing Mary Silicon X was so that they could choose between processors and still retain the same camera software features because they have that coprocessor that they can rely on. And that completely yeah. blew up my entire theory. But when I first noticed that it didn't have the Mary Silicon X because I was IQ, it was so hard to find information about it. But when I got the phone, I started digging. I was like, doesn't have it. And I was like, maybe it's requiring a Qualcomm chip. Maybe the way it interfaces with the SOC or the memory system, right, is requiring a Qualcomm chip. But clearly not because this has it. So that's good. That's good news. But yeah, I think it just shows you how Oppo made a Find X5 Pro that was a cost saving version for China, which is kind of crazy, right? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So there you go. Mary Silicon X on a mid ranger. So that tells us a lot, you know, um, which I think is very, very interesting. And I was going to say, you know, I was completely blown away by the Find X5 Pro's low light video performance. Oh, it's incredible. I, the video is I, unreal. I heard good things, but you know, seeing is believing. And I went to the, the county fair a few weeks ago and took it to one of those uh, spinny uh, chair things where, you know, everyone's hanging by a chain and they're spinning oh, around. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And the quality, like the frame rate and like just the image quality was unbelievable. Like, no, there is no other way to view how good it is except for looking at it on the screen because nothing can reproduce how good that looks. And it, it's, it really made me believe that like it's the best phone for video, at least in my opinion. And honestly, it's the first time I've ever used an Android phone where I was like, I can do low light video. You're right. I was, there's not, it's like an iPhone. There wasn't a single drop frame in there. Unbelievable. Buttery smooth. And it's sad that we're saying that. It's really sad that we're saying that, that even Samsung can pull off giving us video without drop frames. Anyway, so that's uh, basically what we got on the roster for the week. A lot of BBK Group news between the OnePlus, the Realme, and the Oppo there at the end. And then all the Samsung stuff. Um, and of course, uh, Google and nothing kind of upping the mid-range game. I just feel like it's been a good week. I'm excited about this week somehow. Like, I'm bummed that I don't have those two phones that are kind of, you know, changing the game in a way. But it's coming, folks. I'll get them eventually, yeah. I've been massaging my PR contacts. If you're listening, folks, please, you know, thank you. But uh, yeah, I, are you going to get these, you think? Uh, what's your Maybe plan Maybe the, uh, I'll probably get the uh, 6A. Yeah. Um, I just have to like message my contacts at Google because they've given to, give them to me before. Usually they give me the flagships because that's usually what they focus on um, with analysts. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm actually excited to play with the Red Magic 7S Pro because um, that active cooling is probably going to be the best performing uh, Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 chip uh, on a phone just because it has active cooling. And uh, in previous generations of testing the, the Red Magic phones, specifically their Pro version, um, it's been the one that retains performance most consistently. While 100%. Gaming. Even with the fan turned off on the Red Magic 7 that reviewed for hard hardware a little few months ago, I was getting 95 to 97% stability on the 20 minute tests, uh, which is unreal for a passive cooling solution. And then if you turn on the active cooling, it was 99.9% .9 stability yeah. for 20 minutes. And what I like about the pro phones, which is my first time playing with, I had the seven pro for a bit, but I have the seven S pro now is that they're more compact because there is the bezels are even and you have no uh, speakers on the front. They're on the sides. Um, and the under display camera means that you get an uninterrupted, f essentially screen in your hands. Um, and you know, gaming phones are really big and heavy and this thing is big and heavy, but not as big and heavy as the, the non pro version, which I think is nice. And, and speaking of even bezels, I know we're in the weeds right now a bit, but the, that's the thing that blew me away the most about the phone one is that you, you know how much it costs to get a display with completely even bezels on an Android phone. Like Apple does it, but they plan for it and their supply chain is insane so they can justify the cost. But the fact that the nothing phone one is so affordable and has an incredibly equal bezel all the way around, which is, I believe very few Android phones do. You have to go to the super high end or like, I think Google did it once with the five, like it's kind of amazing, you know, it's, it's an aesthetic thing. 
it's the details. I love the attention to detail. And that's what Carl Pei is really good at. On that note, I just want to say, I've been kind of testing the 5G broadband from T-Mobile. And this entire show was done over a 5G router from T-Mobile that's powering my entire house in San Francisco right now. And I'm getting not incredible numbers, but I'm getting about 150 to 200 megabits down and 50 to 70 megabits up consistently, consistently with absolutely no drops, no latency issues, no problems. This is a second generation product. And I have to tell you that if you have good signal on that thing, you should have a really good experience. I'm, I'm, it's exceeding my expectations. So there you go. This is the, uh, the MediaTek based one. I have no idea. Is it, does it look like a square or like a it trash can? It looks like can? a square, not a, a trash can. Yeah, that's the MediaTek one. The first one was a Qualcomm Nokia. And the second one is like a MediaTek. I forget the name of a, the ODM, but yeah, it's a media, it's a complete top to bottom MediaTek solution. This thing, basically, I plugged it into my network from the Ethernet port, and I have been very, very impressed. Now, you're not going to get gigabit speeds out of this, like, but I'm at four out of five bars. So there's headroom here. If I could get five bars, I bet you my download speed could be better. But for me, the biggest limitations, I, I can't get fiber here. I can only get Doxis 3.1, and I can get fantastic download speeds, but my upload speeds are capped at about 20 max max on cable right now so this is giving me 60 50 70 it's a doubling of my upload speed so that's pretty exciting i feel bad for you i, I hope i don't have to move to a place where i won't have access to fiber but i completely sympathize with you in previous previous places where i lived my uh, place in vancouver has one gig symmetric for 65 dollars a month in as Canadian dollars, so you do the math. So this is, you know, <laughs> like this, it's funny because a block away from me, I can get fiber here in San Francisco. It's literally like, I'm right at the edge of what they built out and no provider is going to give it to me. I've got the choice between the evil cable companies and, oh, do I want AT&T DSL? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So now I've got T-Mobile here kicking ass, okay? I just want to say, like, this is not a sponsored piece, guys, but, like, I am blown away by this. This is so good. I did not expect it to be this good. And it's been stable for over an hour. It's been stable for days now. I am in Slack and in Zoom calls and in Google Meets all day long with my team at Pocket now. So, good way to test it. Anshel, do you want to tell folks where they can find you on the internet? Yeah, I'm pretty much everywhere all at once uh, at Anshel Sog, whether it's Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find and I'm very prolific on Twitter. And you are an analyst, right? Yes. So my, uh, my day job, I am a uh, analyst for more insights and strategy and I cover the smartphone space, but I also cover technologies like 4G, 5G and Wi-Fi. I cover lots of semiconductors. I cover XR extensively. And uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun in the last couple of years with everything kind of blowing up all at once. For sure. Folks, check out Anshel on social and also on Forbes. You write from time to time. And you know where to find me. I'm at Tank Girl everywhere. T-N-K-G-R-L. Think Tank Girl, the comic book. Drop all the vowels. That's how my Twitter handle looks. That's how my Instagram handle looks. So if you want to chat about this podcast with me and Anshel, look for us on Twitter. And uh, you know, let us know what you think. And uh, if you want to see pretty pictures of phones and pretty pictures you know, of cars and other tech taken with phones, because I do everything with phones, Check out my Instagram. There is uh, the podcast, of course, mobiletechpodcast.com. There's an RSS feed there if you're old school, but we're on all the platforms, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, everywhere good podcasts can be found. If your app lets you rate or review the show, please consider doing that. If you want some more visuals, you have a couple of YouTube channels to pick from, youtube.com slash mobiletechpodcast and youtube.com slash mobiletechmore. You know how YouTube works. Like, subscribe, tell your friends, click the little notification bell and comment. Comment about the podcast if you'd like. Most of my channels contain unboxing videos and other bits and pieces of visuals. The more channel is more geared towards peripheral stuff like 
travel tech, home automation, car tech, whereas the main channel is more like the phones and personal audio and wearables and stuff like that. Also, there is a Patreon. If you want to help this podcast, you know, you can see a video version of the podcast. I publish it every week. It comes out a couple of days before the public audio version, and you get to see Anshel and me and our faces and us brandishing phones, although I didn't brandish any phones on this show. But sometimes I do, and that's kind of the surprise. But look, there's a tier there that gives you a video version. There's a tier there that gives you access to the Discord server. And I think you should check all that out and see if you can support me. I would appreciate it. And, you know, if you don't want to use Patreon, I totally understand. That's cool. There's a PayPal link in the show notes. Just donate $5. I can buy a coffee, buy myself lunch. Well, not with $5, but coffee. And uh, yeah, consider helping out. I would appreciate it. And finally, of course, you know, we have Audible. Audible's been sponsoring us for years now. They're fantastic. You know, we love them. So you can help out by clicking through this link, audibletrial.com slash mobile tech. That's audibletrial.com slash mobile tech. You get a 30-day free trial and you get to keep a book at the end, whether you stay or not. I think you'll stay because if you're like me and you love books, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's like books being read to you. You know, you're in, like me. You're probably in front of a computer all day. Your eyes are tired. You don't really want to read a book at the end of the day. So you just sit down and relax and put your headphones or earbuds on and just listen to a book. It's fantastic. And it takes multiple days. It's like, like the book experience. You put it down for a while, come back to it. And then they have some short content too. If you want something a little less intense, they have some podcasts. They have all kinds of really good content. I love that a lot of their books are read by the authors. And if you're into that, um, you know, there's just so much good stuff there. Audible is kind of a must have. If you don't have it and you want to help, consider clicking through audibletrial.com slash mobile tech. And I want to thank Audible again for being our longtime sponsor. And of course, I want to thank you, Anjel, for being on the show yet again for the nth time debating the finer things of chip manufacturing processes with me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's always fun and uh, be happy to come back on again. We'll definitely have you on again on shell and folks, you know, we'll have another show next week. So stay tuned for that. And until then, cheers, everybody. This has been the mobile tech podcast with tank girl proudly presented by worldpodcasts.com. You can visit us online at mobile tech